Hello booktube, welcome to another recent reads video. I want to have a little bit of a whinge about book prizes. This week we obviously we had the Woman's Prize long list announced. The week before we had the Stella Prize. We also had the Carol Shields Prize this week. Next week we have the Booker International and the Jalak Prize all release their long list. So we're going to have five long lists that are like current at the same time. And I think one of the real joys uh, about following book prizes is to read a long list and to be part of that conversation with other other people who are reading that long list. I don't feel like it has the same impact when it's not live and it loses some of the joy for me. I think if the job of this these prizes are to promote books. Why would you pick such a prize heavy part of the year when there's there's no prizes running later in the year? Let's finally get to the books, shall we? I want to start with the least objectionable DNF and that's Bad Creed by Jessica Jones. I'm not saying I'm working my way from least to most objectionable, I'm just saying this is the least objectionable DNF. I don't really know why I pick up these sort of books. I know that I don't like magical realism. Long-term viewers of this, even short-term viewers of this channel will know that I don't like magical realism and yet I keep picking them up. Maybe I think they're literary fantasy and they're just not, but I hate magical realism. It doesn't world build. It confuses, it's random, it, everything is unexplained. I feel so discombobulated. The world is full of endless possibilities. A dragon could just appear and eat all the characters. It's, it's perfectly consistent with what's going on. It's so random. My brain is sort of using all of its power to just figure out the basic occurrence of what is going on, the basic simple plot, and I'm not engaging with the characters' emotions or feelings, I'm not engaging with their desires, I'm not engaging with the ideas or the themes in the novel, and these are the things that I enjoy when I'm reading, I'm not even engaging with whether the writing is nice or not. That's just not a nice place to read from. This is a book where a young woman is haunted by the death of her sister, she keeps jumping between the real world and her dream world, and she sort of brings items between each of these worlds. She, you know, makes sure she goes to sleep with shoes on so she doesn't get trapped in the snow again, and it has a bit of a creepy and a scary feel to it. For magical realism, this was pretty good, but as we've discussed, magical realism is an abomination on literature and should be expunged at the first opportunity. I am going to make a late 2023 resolution that I am going to stop reading the description of books and getting excited by buzzwords and instead I'm going to look for reasons that I won't like a book. I'm going to look for reasons why a book will be maybe best waiting until somebody else has read it and there are a few reviews out there to see if it is the sort of book that I would like. To be honest there are so many new release books out there that I I want to know if they're good or not, but it has distracted me from some of my goals this year. And one of my goals has been to read an average of a classic a week. And I'm not doing that. So I'm going to sort of set myself a, a much harder quota. And I'm going to name two classics in each video. And I'm going to have to read them before the next video. So in this video, I'm gonna name The Go-Between by L.P. Hartley and Hitting a Straight Lick with a Crooked Stick by Zora Neale Hurston. Go as a River by Shelley Reed. And that isn't an instruction to a popular Southern booktuber, that's actually the name of the author. I was lucky enough to get this as an arc from NetGalley, although lucky is a, could be interpreted with an element of satire. This was just basic and boring. It felt like Taylor Jenkins Reid, but she grew up in the South. And I know people love Taylor Jenkins Reid's writing, but she's not for me. And we all get different things about out of novels, and I'm not saying she's a bad writer at all. I'm just saying that the stuff she's doing, I don't care for. Really, I think that's quite complimentary to compare an author to Taylor Jenkins Reid, because some people are going to want to read that now, maybe. In my notes, I said that this is a book for white people. 
I don't remember why, but that just seemed like the sort of salty insult that I wanted to include in my review. Pineapple Street by Jenny Jackson. This is a book about a rich family with grown up children, a son and two daughters in the early stages of adulthood. You know, they're getting married, they're starting a family, they're finding a new partner, that sort of thing. And this was clearly intended to be a satire, but it really just felt like rich people being rich hoity-toity people and having problems that nobody else cared about while owning a whole lot of property and I had to pretend like they weren't blood-sucking vampires that were unworthy of empathy. I'm sure that there was a nice socialist message at the end of this because it was it was definitely satirical, but I just didn't have the patience to wait for it. I just didn't enjoy sitting with these characters waiting for them to get their comeuppance. I just, I don't hate these characters. I just wish they didn't exist. Um, this was definitely another book I needed to be more selective about when I picked it up. I think the book that I'm most disappointed about DNFing here is Hungry Ghost by Kevin Jared Hossein. This was one of my most anticipated reads of the new year. It's a debut, book by debut author. And if this is a book that you are interested in reading, please take my advice and don't do the audiobook. The audio narrator of this book is terrible. I wasn't into this book and it's definitely the fault of the audio narrator, but was it a good book or wasn't it a good book? Do I go out and find myself a physical or e-copy to read it? Or do I just cut my losses and call it a day. I find it very hard to segregate my feelings towards the book and towards the audio narrator when I am reading an audio book. What I'm doing in this case is I'm leaning on the side of not continuing but keeping an open mind. There are certain other reviewers who if they give it a positive review I am much more interested in in it. Our Share of Night by Mariana N. Riquez. With these sort of monster books, I like to give them a full book's length to hook me in. And after a full book, 200, 300 pages, that sort of thing, if it doesn't hook me, I'm not continuing. This is a fantasy novel. It's probably a really good fantasy novel, but it is just a fantasy novel with a bit of horror and a bit of historical fiction thrown into it. But it's fantasy and it's not really my thing. This is just uh, not a Scott book. I have some women's prize books to talk about and I'm going to make a video with all 16 books. So I want to be brief when I talk about these books. But there is, there, there has to be an exception to this. Because Dog of the North is the worst book that I have read since Treacle Walker. For every one of the last five DNFs, I really blame myself for not being selective enough for taking risks. And I, I really see that these are books that will be joyful for other readers, that there is a market for these books, that they are books that I could say were well done, but not for me. I cannot say this about The Dog of the North. I do not know who the market is. This was just terrible. Even Treacle Walker, Alan Gardner was intentionally writing nonsense to try and pass it off as something intelligent. There's no way that you're passing this nonsense off as something intelligent. I like to give books enough time to understand what they're trying to do, but I realised that I was actually never going to figure that out. And I think that that's because the author, Elizabeth McKenzie, didn't know herself. This is the least thought-provoking book I have read potentially ever. The plot is moronic, the situations are divorced from reality, and I can only assume that it's meant to be a comedy, but one would like to think that a comedy had some element of humour in it. What else could it possibly be? It is so ridiculous that somebody must have thought that that was hilarious, and it just doesn't translate from the author's mind to the page. The character drawing? Pathetic. The general level of writing was um, the lower side of average. The book really should never have been published. And that it has made it to the Woman's Prize long list is a real abomination. I, You know, there are so many talented authors out there who don't get the exposure that would really kickstart their career and give them a fan base. 
And then something as terrible as this makes it, it makes me feel bad for the rest of the long list. What on earth are the judges thinking when they put a book like this on there? There is books that don't work for readers and then there are bad books. And this is a bad book. Legit, if you have read this book and not even if you liked it, if you think it is possible for somebody to like it, tell me who the market is. This isn't even pretentious enough to pretend to be Joyce-esque fiction. Okay, I've finished 10 books. Let's talk about the 10 books. Uh, I will basically be going through them in order of least favourite to most favourite, but with the caveat that I'm going to discuss the Woman's Prize books separately. And first, Children of Paradise, a story of a young woman who starts working at a cinema with a bunch of misfits. There's not a real plot to speak of. There's quite a strong setting, but a lot of the events are unrealistic, but possible. It's not like unrealistic, it would never happen, but just, I think you've been a bit silly. It's really a bit of a kaleidoscope of weird in with the mundanity of ordinary life. It's quite satirical in places, but I think the issues that are presented in this are presented and not discussed. There's just a little bit too simple. It's a lack of meat in this book. I don't think it portrays some of the issues in the light that it intends. Wandering Souls is about a Vietnamese family who flee from the Vietnam War aboard two boats. One boat makes it to Hong Kong, the other does not. We follow the family as they try to navigate life in Thatcher, England. I found the structure of this a bit discombobulating. It is all over the place in time and character. We get narration from a dead character who is looking over the family. And the pacing of this book is a little bit too fast for me to appreciate the emotional nuance that the author was trying to bring to it. But I think the book itself is quite powerful and I grow fonder of this book the longer it has been since I finished it. The other books. Sula by Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison is an author I really want to love, but I just don't. I often think a good book sort of needs to layer complexity have something simple, have something a little bit more difficult and work your way up. I think that uh, for me, it gives me something easy to get and then something a little bit harder to get. And, you know, it, it, it allows me to have interest in what is being said as I figure it out. And I think that Toni Morrison starts on a hundred. I think that she knows the tapestry of themes and ideas she wants to mix together, but that she doesn't give me any breadcrumbs to to get there. But maybe maybe there's just something about her writing that doesn't click with me because I find myself not connecting with the characters, getting a bit bored, not paying attention, and then missing more stuff and, and just sort of a vicious cycle. Once you sort of lose interest in a book, it's very hard to get yourself back into it and often you should DNF. Maybe I should have DNF this. I don't know what it is about Toni Morrison that I don't get along with, but I don't remember Sula at all. I think I will put her on the back burner, try her again in five years' time and see if the bluest eyes work for me or whichever Morrison book I feel like next. This Devastating Fever from Sophie Cunningham. This is probably another book I could have told that I wouldn't have liked if I paid more attention to what the synopsis was and not got worked up in the hype. This is a novel based in the present day about Leonard Wolf, who is dead. Leonard and Virginia both appear to the author of this book, who is a character in this book but has changed her name from Sophie Cunningham to Alice, as ghosts. And they have conversations about what's going on in the current world. At one point, Virginia Woolf even starts to tell Alice what Freud thinks about something. Apparently, they're friends in the afterlife. They get to comment on the similarity between Spanish flu and COVID, Trump's presidency. And I think every chapter includes the line, Alice couldn't find a way to include this insert random fact about one of the Bloomsbury set in her novels. So... Here it is. I think this, this is an indulgent piece from the author who is clearly very interested in the wolves and wanted to comment on various things and couldn't really figure out a way to put them all together in a novel. I think that she should have been writing a non-fiction book about the wolves and 
maybe an essay about COVID and Trump. This was just experimental nonsense. I mean, I guess all books is essentially conversations with imaginary people, but it felt very indulgent to have a ghost of Virginia Woolf or Leonard Woolf following you around and appearing and conversing with them about the the issues of the day it just it didn't feel natural (laughs) just felt ridiculous but the writing was nice the author is clearly quite talented i think that the experiment hasn't worked and that it was uh, a terrible idea to be honest but i i think that hardcore literary critics are going to love this book this has got ponce written all over it this is going to be somebody's wet dream this novel this is for for critics who have a high level of hubris who want their reviewers to think of them as intelligent. I think I like the rest of the books. They're Going to Love You by Meg Howery. A six foot one a dancer finds out that her gay father is very sick and probably going to die soon, but there has been a tra- betrayal 19 years ago. Carlisle hasn't spoken to Robert in 19 years, and she used to be very close to James, her father-in-law I guess although I don't know if James and Robert were married or just living together. This takes place during the AIDS crisis and it's such a weird intersection of themes. There's ballet, there's size and being a being a big dancer, what it takes to make it in that industry. Then we've got a father-daughter relationship, children, children of gay parents, how they get along with their parents' new partner. Carlisle is also in constant contact with her mother who isn't fond of Robert, her ex, but also doesn't completely hate him. I think that the mother is actually really well drawn. The complex set of feelings somebody might have towards uh, an ex that they have had a child with who turned out to be gay is quite well wrapped up within the, the mother. I often don't think that there are many new ideas out there for novels and what we do instead is we read combinations of ideas that are unique and this is a really different set of ideas all pushed together and I think that that's what makes this novel stand out as something a bit different. Yeah overall I thought this was a good novel and I I think I regret putting it this far down the list. I think that it's much better than I am given it credit for when I have prepared this. Acts of Service by Lillian Fishman. I don't know what I thought of this book. Essentially a woman, a lesbian, in a committed relationship, posts a nude of herself online and gets a message from another woman. She goes and she meets her only to find out that this woman messaging her is representing a couple. So she starts having sex with the couple as you do. It is a very sexual novel, a lot of filth in it. What our protagonist Eve likes to do is observe people, who they are, how they interact with people. She likes couples. She likes to see what the power dynamic is in the couple, how they change when they talk about certain situations. So we get this very intimate portrait of this couple, Olivia and Nathan, but it's not a passive narrator because Eve is sleeping with them. This kind of has this like Lolita feel to it. Not not that it's about child abuse, but you know when you're reading about a novel that is discussing a problematic subject and it has been overly intellectualized for the purpose of the novel. This kind of feels like that. Although having a queer woman grapple with the idea of heterosexual desire seems joyfully backwards. We live in, you know, such a heteronormative world. I feel like gay people have a much better idea of the sexuality of straight people, but most straight people probably don't even know what a popper is. We do get this really interesting commentary on love, consent, sacrifice, desire, power dynamic, mostly power dynamic within a relationship. But at the same time, it feels quite cheap. It feels needlessly sexual, but there is no way that this book could have been written without all the intimate sex scenes in it. And I don't think it's actually a fair criticism of it, but I think that this is a criticism that will upset people that will turn people off from this book. I think this book will require a level of analysis from the reader. There is a lot of vagary in this book and it could be easily interpreted as glorifying an abusive relationship, which it isn't. But 
I think clearly the target for this book, it's not the Nathans of this world, it is the Eves and Olivias that are the target. So rather than normalising an abusive relationship, is it simply showing them one objectively so that they can see it and run? And it's not like the most abusive relationship, it's almost like the least abusive relationship, but there are so many red flags in this. I often think that showing those relationships back to people when they haven't invested in them really hits home to people and is of great value. I think Fishman is incredibly talented. I think this was very ambitious. I think that she has written it very close to the line and she is probably guilty of trusting her readers a little bit more than she should. And this is the reason why it is getting such conflicting reviews. If you're not put off by the overly sexual nature of this novel and the sort of cheapness of flesh aspect to it, then I think you will enjoy the relationship analysis that is left. The Queens of Saramento Park by Camilla Souza Villadala. Translated by Kit Moore. This is also called Bad Girls in the US, so depending on where you are, pick your title. This is the story of a bunch of trans prostitutes who are living together when the mother of the house discovers a baby and decides to raise it. But let me say this, this book is much more about trans women than it is about the raising of a child. That is much more of a subplot to what's going on here. It's very much a portrait of a group of people through a collection of experiences, allowing us to see what is in common and what is different. I quite enjoyed the discussion about a group of men who have fled a civil war and then been attracted to trans women because they could see the trauma in them and they felt a shared comradeship, a shared experience with them. I thought that that was such a powerful depiction. I think I like this book without loving it. I think that if I was trans and I was seeing myself in the pages here, that this would be fantastic. I also think that if I read this as one of the first pieces of trans literature as a way to learn about trans people, not that I am an expert, I know basically nothing, but I do know more than I did a year ago. I think that that would be good for you as well. I don't really feel like the individual characters stood out too much and it made me feel like this collection of women was talking about all trans women instead of individual characters. I know that trans women work in the sex industry at an incredibly high rate and I know that that is because employment opportunities suck for them because of homophobia and transphobia but I would have liked to have seen more about how they got into selling their bodies and I would have liked to have seen a little bit more about the danger of various situations the danger in turning a trick and the excitement and the thrill of turning a, a trick and the like the complexity of different emotions that would go through your soul in that situation. I still think that this is a fantastic novel that is very well worth reading, but I was expecting this to blow me away and be one of the best books I've read all year, judging by the reviews of it, and it just turned out to be a good read. Independence by Chitra Banji Divrakani. I have a whole review out on this already. This is a historical fiction that follows three sisters around the time of partition. This book tackles ambition, sexism, education, domestic violence, being a, a business owner and being a woman at the same time, the Hindu-Muslim divide, the Hindu-Muslim divide during partition, forbidden love, family and sisterhood. If you want to know more, you can watch my review. I like this one. If you're a fan of feminist historical fiction, this one is for you. If you like books like The Marriage Portrait, even though these are completely different books, I think that this is one you should pick up. All That's Left Unsaid by Tracy Leanne is an absolutely fantastic novel. Set in the 90s in the Sydney suburb of Karamata, the 18-year-old son of Vietnamese refugees is beaten to death in a crowded restaurant but nobody saw it. This is the Australian novel that everybody should buy this year. Pivotal to this novel are two political events that happened in Australia in the 90s that 
international viewers will not know about it. even maybe younger Australian viewers won't know about it. Firstly is the rise of Pauline Hanson, Australia's white nationalist racist group and Australia's only political assassination. It deals with the 5T crime gang which is a Vietnamese drug selling gang and the perception of Vietnamese refugees at that time which is and we're going to say a whole bunch of things that aren't true but that have been said about Sudanese refugees in Australia right now, they don't assimilate, they don't work, they just turn to crime, they're living off the dole. What I love about this book is it's about the realities of coming from a low socioeconomic families, the attitudes that exist and the challenges you face. It's not really a book that is that much about racism. Don't get me wrong, this is a book about what it means to be a Vietnamese person living in Australia in the 90s. Racism is a fact of life, but it's about Vietnamese people. It's not about racism. It's about the lives of children and their parents and how they judge each other. The line, we're poor, but we're not so poor that we didn't have anything to eat comes up at one point. And I thought that that was a, a really interesting way of judging one another. It builds a picture of both the poverty that exists and also of the community. I thought distrust of the police was depicted really well. Key, the protagonist of this book, the sister of Denny, the murdered child, is working with the police to try and find his killer but her parents won't and there's an argument about whether they get an autopsy or not and it just points out this us versus them mentality. This is a mystery novel at its heart but I'm not sure that this is a book for mystery readers. I think that it has very complex character portraits and dark themes that include murder and gang violence and, and racism. This is a brilliant example of how you create a series of characters who are different and independent but who coexist to create a group of people who have one identity. This is a great book. What White People Can Do Next by Emma Tabiri is fantastic. White people, you're the victim of racism too. You would gain from dismantling the system of oppression that keeps coloured people down. I just love Emma Dabiri so much. There are so many people writing on this topic and none of them are as good as Dabiri. In fact, I kind of wish they would all stop publishing books so everybody can catch up with what Dabiri is saying. You cannot effectively be an anti-racist without also being a feminist. You cannot effectively be a feminist without looking out for disabled people. You cannot effectively look out for disabled people without being a fat activist. You cannot effectively be a fat activist without fighting transphobia. You you cannot effectively fight transphobia without also fighting homophobia and you cannot fight homophobia without embracing socialism, without fighting class oppression. All of these issues are interlinked and capitalism is the key to the oppression of everybody. 40% of all people killed by the police are white. When black people want to change the police force to stop them killing innocent people, white people benefit too. There are so many examples like this in this very intelligent, very powerful, very short and easy to digest non-fiction book. My only concern or criticism of this is I really hope that white people read this book and that it affects change in them. Unfortunately, I think that once you invest in the house, you don't want to hear it be criticised. Even if you've been offered a nicer house, you'll just close your ears to what is being said in a way that I don't think that you can have an intelligent argument against. Dabiri knows her shit. She's clearly correct. I'm worried that even though she's brilliant, that she's not going to change minds. And I hope that I'm wrong on that. If you consider yourself anti-racist or if you just consider racism wrong, please read this book. It's, it's easy to read. It's relevant to you in your life. So much more than you even realise. Dabiri quite frequently quotes James Baldwin and then expands upon what he was saying. And we all know that James Baldwin is an absolute genius. And I'm, I'm saying that Dabiri takes that to the next level. This is the best non-fiction book I have read. Maybe ever. Maybe, maybe best is the wrong word. This is the most important, the most accurate, the most needed non-fiction book that I have read in a while. This is great. Do you have any thoughts or feelings on any of the books that I have read? Let me know. Tell me what you're reading right now, what you just finished, what you're going to pick up next. Like, subscribe and all that stuff. Bye bye.